Okay, so I am Ted Ficken. Those of you that don't know me, um, I've been a music therapist since 1974. So been around for quite a long time. I was vice president of the Great Lakes region when I lived in Minnesota and I was president of the Western region. I normally live in Salem, Oregon. Right now I'm in Springfield, Virginia. So I am here to talk to you about a book that I just had published. And, well, if I can, oh, there's, there's the book. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of background about the book and then uh, talk about how it applies to music therapy. So it's music of hate, music for healing, paired stories from the hate music industry and the profession of music therapy. So why I wrote the book, um, as most of us I think are aware, hate has been growing in our uh, environment. Um, we're very polarized politically. There's a lot of um, hate being expressed about different groups. These are just some of the statistics. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time reading my slides to you, but I'll give you a couple of seconds to look at, at these bullet points. Um, we've seen an increase in hate crimes against various groups. Um, we've seen, uh, I like that last bullet, in, in 2017, there were more hate speech tweets on Twitter than Major League Baseball, the Super Bowl, and the Game of Thrones combined. So we're just seeing a, an increase in hate. Uh, even the U.S. House of Representatives last year passed a anti-hate measure um, it doesn't carry a lot of weight, but it reminds our legislators to fight against racism and bigotry and uh, support tolerance, religious freedom and, and special protections. And they actually increased the language of groups that they wanted to spread that um, protection to. When I went through school um, to become a music therapist, the only textbook at that time was called Music and Therapy, edited by E. Thayer Gaston. Some of you may be familiar with that. He was kind of called the father of modern music therapy. And he, one of the quotes in that book was, music is derived from the tender emotions. The vast majority of all music is concerned with positive relationships that draw men fell closer to his fellow man and women, love, loyalty, patriotism, and religion. So I was taught that, I was, as many of us were, that music is for good um, and is positive. Then in 2014, I read this article, Music, Money, and Hate, um, taught for, published by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a group in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, that uses legal means to address and help people who have been discriminated against. Um, but this was the first time I had heard about hate music. I wasn't familiar with it, so I started studying it. So that was six years ago. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center actually maintains what they call their hate map. Um, and this tracks various hate groups in the United States. And if you see in the upper left-hand corner, you can sort it. And one of the sorts is uh, by hate music. So if I pull that sort, hate music, you can see the red dots um, currently, and, and it changes all the time. So this was as of um, late 2019. These were where hate music groups were located in the United States. I talked to the guy who wrote this article, and he said, well, most of those are distributors of hate music. They're not individual artists. They're not... Um, uh, bands, things like that, but they, they're they distributors. So I started by looking at those distributors and studying them, but then I broadened my study to look at groups and musicians. So what is hate music? Let's start there. There are several definitions. Again, I'm not going to read the slide to you, but I'll give you a second to look at it. Um, it's destructive, it's hurtful, it's angry, um, it can be all those adjectives in that last definition 
races, superior, intolerant, absolute, hateful, illegal. Um, so there are definitions out there, but what I, when I looked at it and started studying it, I found some really common characteristics. And that's really what I wanna focus on. These are the common characteristics, which I'll come back to a couple of times. A direct expression of hatred. So it's music that actually comes out and says, I hate some group. Um, it encourages violence against a, a specific demographic group or individual. A lot of use of slang, profanity, derogatory names for groups of people, um, perpetuating negative and false stereotypes, lack of support for the law, and it, in, in some cases expressing support for criminal activity, and antisocial leaning, meaning having a lack of empathy for others and a lack of remorse for their own behaviors. So hate music might not have all of these characteristics at the same time, some of them do, uh, but some of them have maybe four, three or four of these characteristics. Um, I think we're all uh, familiar with a normal bell curve. A lot of hate music falls in the extremes far right, not so much the far left, but the far right extreme groups, but then kind of crossing over into normal variation a little bit lately. But I wanted to see how long has this been going on? A couple of actual music therapy friends of mine recommended going to the historic sheet music archives. So I went back, I visited six different um, historic sheet music archives. And I'm going to quickly just show you um, the covers of some sheet music, and you'll see the dates when these songs were written right above them. So you can see the um, stereotypical language, name calling, um, songs about the Ku Klux Klan, this one titled A Comic Song. Uh, that, this one written in 1868 was actually uh, a part of Ulysses S. Grant's presidential campaign against the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the one on the right was a you know, segregationist song, Stay in Your Own Backyard, Don't, Don't Play Together. Um, there was a whole series of songs called um, and I won't use the word, but it starts with a C. Um, C songs um, talking and providing stereotypes about Black Americans. Native Americans um, were also focused on, here's another Ku Klux Klan song, this one in favor of the Ku Klux Klan on the right. Um, Here's a World War I song, what kind of American are you and what are you doing over here? So first of the anti-immigrant songs um, and an anti-German song, which struck me because my ancestors came to America from Germany. Um, like I said, Native Americans were a focus of some of these older songs, depicting them as thieves and alcoholics. Um, here's a World War II song, You Can't Win This War Through Love. And then on the right is actually a poster from the Nazis um, combining black music and jazz music and calling it degenerate music. So it's been around for a while, even though hate is new, seems new to us in our, our current environment. It's been around for a long time and music played a part. So let me give you some more recent examples. Um, in my book, I talk about racist songs and chants like used at Charlottesville, um, anti-religion music. Um, there's a lot of anti-Semitic music, which we didn't see a lot in those earlier sheet music examples, but they're more, they came into prominence after World War II and really spread to our country and now anti-Muslim. Um, anti-immigrant music, misogynist music, which is hatred of women, 
Um, there, there is anti-police, there's anti-LGBTQ+, anti-disabled um, music, or also called ableist music. And then these other new forms, it's, these genres take on new names, hatecore, fash wave, which is the um, racist waving at anti-fascists, um, porn grind, which is a very misogynist form of music, and murder music, which was anti-gay. Um, I found hate music in all musical genres. Um, you name it, rock, rap, hip hop, jazz, classical. I found hate music in all genres. Some of the hate music bands, here are just some examples of their names. Um, and you can just see from the names, some of their uh, causes and their belief systems, uh, Jew slaughter, um, brutal attack, no remorse, um, Prussian blue, that was a pair of teenage girls who Prussian blue is the color of the residue of the gas used in Nazi concentration camps to kill Jewish um, people. Um, the, probably the most famous um, hate music band in the world is Screwdriver, a band out of England, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. But they're not shy about what they believe in and, and uh, using names that really attract other people. Um, the functions of hate music are to recruit members to hate groups, to raise funds for those hate groups through publications, uh, record companies, concerts, um, to teach and reinforce the ideology, um, provide a setting for meeting with others. It's a social setting. Uh, motivate hate-related activities and create a feeling of power and control. Um, it's pretty underground, but it's becoming less so. So let me tell you about the book. So I started studying hate music and I decided to match stories from our field, music therapy and hate music. So there's 14 stories in the book uh, on the left-hand side of this table, um, these are some of the stories of bands, of individual artists, of record companies, of um, distributors, et cetera. And since those groups, the ones on the left, attack these different demographic groups, I decided to tell the stories of music therapists from those demographic groups. So I'm gonna give you a couple of, well, I'll give you a minute to look at this chart. Um, some of the music therapist names you probably recognize. Um, some of them are still around, still doing great work. Um, there's a couple of pioneers in that list that you might not be familiar with. Felice Wolmut and Valley Weigel are not well known, but they were uh, pioneers who escaped from Austria in 1938 to avoid the Nazis, came to, the Ameri came to America and became music therapists. Um, but some of these other people you might recognize. Um, and what, I, what I'm trying to do is tell their story, it, their backstory. Um, it's, they didn't write the chapter. I interviewed them and, and they told me their story and then I wrote up their story. So it's a, a book of contrasts and juxtapositions and how they interrelate relate with each other, how hate affected them. Uh, I'm just using music therapy as a tool to um, kind of feed the social justice, systemic racist uh, discussion. Uh, here's, here's what hate music does and here's what music therapists do to, as a kind of a counter story. So for example, I tell the story of Jew Slaughter. Jew Slaughter was a band in Portland, Oregon, which, and I live in Oregon. Um, they, one of their members was Wade Michael Page, who also played in these other bands on the right there. He's also known as the Sikh Temple Killer. Um, on, in 2012, he killed six people at a Sikh temple in Wisconsin. 
um, and then he, he was shot by police and then he shot himself in the head after being wounded. Um, but he, he played in all of these uh, white power neo-Nazi skinhead bands. And I matched his story and Jew slaughter story with Felice Woolman. Felice was an opera singer in Europe. Um, she was born in 1897. She escaped from the Nazis in 1938 when they invaded Austria, came to the United States, was a uh, voice and opera teacher at several colleges in the United States. She ended up in Portland, Oregon as head of the um, voice department at University of Portland. And then she retired at 65 and became a registered music therapist and worked for another 15 years, uh, mostly with children. She also worked at the Nordoff and Robbins School um, back in Philadelphia. And uh, she also made trips back to Europe and worked at schools in Europe on, in, during her summers. Very interesting woman. I actually got to, to know her when I was a young music therapist and she was in her 80s. I got a chance to take her to our music therapy meetings, but I didn't know that much about her till I started studying her life. I just learned someone in Vienna is right now doing her master's thesis about Felice. Okay, another example, I tell the story of Jared Lee Loeffner, who is the man who shot Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. He had been listening to Let the Bodies Hit the Floor, and he was a fan of the Mayhem Fest Festival, which kind of advocates for anarchy. He was also very mentally ill. Um, and so I tell his story, and then I tell the story of Megan Morrow, who's the music therapist who treated Gabby Giffords and helped Gabby regain speech. Um, and she told me her story and how she got involved and, and how her experience with, with Gabby Giffords changed her, um, some of her views about gun control and also about politics. Um, I'll come back to another example in a minute, but here are some of the record companies um, probably the most famous um, and most successful is a company called Resistance Records. It was started in Canada by a guy named George Berge. George was the lead singer for the band Rahoa, which stands for Racial Holy War. Um, he's still around. Um, Panzerfaust grew out of Resistance Records. They had a project called Project Schoolyard where they made 10,000 CDs of racist music and distributed them to middle school and high school students. And the owner of Panzerfaust Records said, we not only entertain racists, we create racists by using music. Um, some of these other bands, you see the number 88 in NSM 88 records and get some 88 records. 88 stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet, which is H, and stands for Heil Hitler. Um, so again, they're not very subtle about what they're advocating for. Um, but some of these record companies are still out there, still selling. I had no trouble buying copies of Hate Music to do my research. In fact, they, they take credit cards over the internet and they have speedy delivery. Um, so let me talk a minute about misogynist music. Since the profession of music therapy is estimated by AMTA as being 87% female. Um, so misogyny is hatred of women contempt of or ingrained prejudice against women, probably the largest group of hate music. I found thousands of songs that were disrespectful to women. I didn't find almost any that were similar to men. So one of the most uh, recent examples was last year, uh, Connor Betts um, killed nine people, including his own sister 
and wounded 17 others in Dayton, Ohio. Um, he was the lead singer of a misogynist heavy metal band called Menstrual Munchies. And they released songs about rape, murder, and other gruesome acts against women. Performed, he also performed with a band called Putrid Liquid. And you can see the titles of some of the albums that they released. Um, I had never heard of porn grind before, but that's what this genre of music is uh, referred to as. He also had some drug problems and some mental health issues. Another example of misogynist music is an artist named Boyd Rice. Here's his album, Hatesville. You can see how he depicts women. Um, and he has a song on this album called Let's Hear It for Violence Towards Women, where he actually, over a techno music background, he rants about why women are only exist to provide sex and to be beaten. And um, you can see some of the other titles on this album, Mr. Intolerance, I Am a Man, Sometimes I Hate. Although there is a song, Love Will Change the World. Um, but he, he has been very outspoken about his misogynist beliefs. Um, I asked, when I bought this album to, for my research, I was listening to the song, Let's Hear It for Violence Towards Women, and I had headphones on and I forgot to turn off the external speakers. And my wife charged into the room and said, turn that off right away, um, which is not funny. Um, I paired this story of misogynist music with Daughters of Harriet, some of you may be familiar with them. It's five music therapists from a variety of religions and backgrounds and uh, demographics who sing song, songs of positiveness. They do a lot of chat circles at music therapy conferences. Um, Barbara Dunn is from the state of Washington. Robin Rio is in Virginia. Jody Windwalker is in Oregon. Um, Lisa Jackert is in Southern California and Maureen uh, Harnes is in Utah. And they come together to lead chant circles. So again, these common characteristics kind of flowed through the book and I illustrated them with some of these examples. I won't give you all of the examples. Uh, I want you to buy the book <laughs> and read it. Um, but let's talk about music therapy. So we get some guidance from our organizations. Um, AMTA does have a non-discrimination and equal opportunity policy. And you can, hopefully you're aware of that. Um, you can see the list of protected classes there, race, ethnicity, color, religion, ancestry, age, etc. So they want us to be non-discriminatory and fair to all people. Our current code of ethics, which was updated last year, um, I listed a couple of principles, respect, dignity, and rights of all, excuse me, identify and recognize your personal biases, act with compassion, and be aware and accepting of the client's individual factors and cultural differences. So this brought to my mind, yes, we can work with people um, who are from different races, different sexual identities, different um, socioeconomic statuses for sure, but what would you do if you got a hate um, crime perpetrator as a client? What would you do if you had a client that hated everybody? Um, which is unique, I think. Um, I, I know some music therapists that have had clients like that, but um, not very many. I think it's in the minority. Uh, we also have standards of practice, um, including the assessment, looking at the client's um, 
response to music, music skills, and musical preferences. So what if you have a client that prefers hate music? Um, it, the music therapy assessment explores the client's culture. So what if they were raised um, in a very racist culture? Um, or they've been discriminated against. So it all plays into a lot of where we might see people in music therapy practice. This is from the board certification domains, interact with the client in an authentic, ethical, and culturally competent manner that respects privacy, dignity, and human rights. So again, you might see a victim of a hate crime. You might see the perpetrator of a hate crime. And you have to be prepared to deal with both of them. So I tried to think of where you might encounter hate music in a music therapy setting, certainly in mental health settings, because we've seen some of the hate musicians and hate crime perpetrators had mental health issues. Um, you might encounter haters who are experiencing guilt and remorse and trying to give up their hateful beliefs. You might have pediatric clients that have been taught at home to hate people. Um, you might, I mentioned victims of hate crimes and perpetrators of hate crimes. But as haters age, you might have haters who are encountering medical issues. They might be having Parkinson's disease. They might be having cancer. They might be having Alzheimer's. Um, so, they might have lived their whole life hating other people and now they're needing help because of their medical issues. Adolescents who have been abused or bullied frequently become um, angry at the world for how they've been treated and they're really ripe to be recruited to hate groups. Um, you might, if you work in a forensic setting with people who have committed crimes or, or who have been charged with crimes like um, Jared Lee Loeffner that shot Gabby Giffords. Um, you might have clients with personality disorders and with a, a, a antisocial personality disorder that again, they might not have much of a conscience. They don't care if they hurt people. They don't have any remorse. So really you can experience hate music um, in almost any music therapy setting. Um, probably more common in some than others. So what are some things we can do as music therapists? And I don't cover a lot of this in the book. I talk more about um, hate music as a public health issue and something that can be addressed. Um, but as a music therapist, you need to assess your own biases. I encourage you to make a list of all of your characteristics. What's your gender, what's your age, where did you grow up, what religion are you, um, everything you can think of, and then make a list of due to your characteristics, what do you support, what do you believe, and what do you not support and not believe, um, and really learn about your own biases. And then take some actions to um, broaden your own demographic knowledge to learn more about other groups and what they've experienced. Um, there's also um, some objective measures of bias on the internet. You can take tests. I've taken a couple of them. I don't understand completely how they work because some of them are very interesting. There's one at Harvard University that just shows you really quick photos and you say whether you like or dislike those photos and then it tells you something about how biased you are. Um, but I think it is important to, that we constantly assess our own biases. Um, this is a man I interviewed for the book. He's the director of the Oregon Coalition Against Hate Crimes. And one of the things he said to me was, don't hate the haters because a lot of them were abused or traumatized as youth. And he said to hate them back is just to re-traumatize re them and make them hate the world all the more. Uh, a number of them have joined and formed a group called Life After Hate. So here are five of the founders of Life After Hate. Christian Picciolini, 
It's from Chicago. He um, has a TV series called Breaking Hate, and he has written a book. TJ Layden um, is in Southern California. He's also written a book, and he now speaks for the Simon Weisenthal Center. He speaks against hatred for them. Arno Michaelis is from Wisconsin. He was the lead singer in a neo-Nazi white power band. Frank Mink was in Philadelphia. He was a, also a, a neo-Nazi skinhead, went to prison. Um, he was invited by some black inmates to join a Bible study group and found that he really liked those black men. And then when he got out of prison, he was hired by a Jewish businessman and they discovered that they both loved ice hockey and became friends. And suddenly he realized, why am I hating these people that I've never even met before that have been so kind to me? Tony McAleer, he's from Canada. He actually helped um, resistance records get going with George Birdie. And these guys have all written books. So Christian Picciolini wrote White American Youth. That was the name of his band. He was the lead singer. Um, uh, TJ Layden wrote From Hate to Hope. Arno Michaelis, My Life After Hate. Um, Frank Mink, the one that liked ice hockey. Um, he talks about uh, recovering from hatred. And this is the latest one. Tony McAleer's book just came out this, this year. The Cure for Hate, and he actually talks about his own treatment and what it was like for him, what his therapy was like. Um, so possible music therapy methods. Um, first of all, do a good music therapy assessment. Make sure you pay close attention to preferred music, cultural music, all that background information. If you're going to use lyric analysis, be aware of the derogatory and profanity and the, the hurtful words in some of the songs. So if you put a person in a group and they wanna to listen to that, it might hurt the other group members. So you might wanna start with working with them on a one-to-one -one basis. You might wanna skip the lyrics and just talk about the musical elements. What do they like about the musical elements? Is it the pitch? Is it the volume? Is it the rhythm? What do they like? What is it that uh, attracts them and what affects them emotionally? Uh, you might not even use recorded music. You might use improvisation or songwriting, have them express themselves by writing their, their own songs. Um, using music for emotional regulation. Uh, I have a music therapy friend who had a client at, I worked at a state hospital for 25 years um, where the client preferred hate music, really loud, angry hate music. And so he would allow the client to go into the sensory room and listen to his hate music for 30 minutes at a time. And he said that client always came out of the sensory room calm, relaxed, and rational. Um, and even though the other staff objected and said, how dare you let him listen to that, that bad music, um, he said it always helped him regulate his emotions. And then we established trust so we could then process why he liked that music. Um, you can have some of the books I just showed you or articles about recovery from hate available. Um, you want to slowly bring people together from different demographic groups so they get to know each other and understand each other. But you also have to protect your group members so they don't get hurt, um, have an unintended consequence. Um, also know your program's policies about censorship. Uh, there was an article in Music Therapy Perspectives, I think, I think last year, maybe in 2018, about censorship. And the researchers found that most music therapists do censor some music. And your program might have um, a policy that says, you can't listen to some music. Where, where I worked, I did a lot of work with alcoholics and drug addicts, and we were not allowed to listen to any music that advocated for drug use. 
Uh, it was just not allowed as part of the treatment. Also use supervision. If you're doing music therapy and you're feeling isolated or feeling like you need help, make sure you have, are getting clinical supervision to discuss the issues and give you some guidance. Personal methods, know your own biases, know your own heritage. I had my DNA tested. I found out that I had a lot of Viking in my blood. Well, the Vikings were rapists and slave owners and pillagers and very violent. And I go, oh, I'm not proud of that heritage. My ancestor, one ancestor came over from Germany in the 1830s. The rest of them stayed in Germany. I found out a lot of my ancestors were Nazis. I wasn't proud of that either. But I did find one, uh, Actually, he was the brother of my grandfather, who was a dentist in Evansville, Indiana, who conducted a choir at the local insane asylum uh, in the early 1900s. <laughs> so, so a little bit of music therapy in my blood too. But find out about your own heritage. It might surprise you what your background is, what your ancestors went through. And then um, increase your knowledge of other heritage. Right now I'm in Virginia and my kids and grandkids live here. So I visit here frequently, but we went to the Holocaust Museum and the African American Museum and the Native American Museum and, and all of these museums where you really see the history, more of the history um, and the trauma and difficulty different ethnic groups have had in our country. Um, educate yourself um, and I, I, I did a lot of research and I wrote this book, but I'm still learning every day about hate and how to counter it. Um, try to disrupt hate at home, school and work if you see it or hear it. Um, we all hate. Um, sometimes we hate a particular kind of food or a particular season, or we hate um, a coworker because they're hard to work with. Um, but we need to tone it down and um, not um, promote hate and uh, turn a blind eye to it. Um, eliminate the, those microaggressions, the little things that you really don't mean anything by, or you think you don't, but it's hurtful to someone else. Um, jokes, comments, um, uh, avoid the casual use of, of hate. Write songs, chants, and compositions focused on the positive. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of us do that. Um, a couple more resources just to share. This is a book, um, Healing from Hate. This is basically the story of Derek Black. He and his father, Don Black, started Stormfront, which is a white power um, website. And Derek went away to college and he started making friends from different races and they started gently confronting his belief system. And he started studying racism and he went to Europe and went to concentration camps and he eventually disavowed all of his original beliefs and turned away from racism at great cost to him. His family completely disowned him. Um, but this is his story. Um, I'm sorry, that's not, that's not his story. This, this is his story. Um, let me go back to this book for a minute. This is the one about how men get into and out of violent extremism. It talks a lot about music and how music is used. Um, and it touches a little bit on women because women are, women account for about between 20 and 25% of hate groups which is almost the opposite of the field of music therapy. Um, American swastika inside the white power movement, hidden spaces of hate. Probably half of this book talks about music and how music is used to recruit people to these hate groups. There's the international web of white power and neo-Nazi hate music. Um, and that is my presentation. Um, this is the book. 
it's uh, available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and any bookstore can order it um, through their normal channels. Um, I give you the ISPN number there. Just It just came out like a month and a half, two months ago. And I wrote, I know, I hope music therapists will be interested in it because of all the stories of music therapists, but I also wrote it with the general public in mind. Um, as I spoke to friends and relatives and neighbors and coworkers, um, a lot of them had not heard about hate music and a lot of them didn't know much about music therapy. So I thought this would be a unique way of teaching them about both. Um, and my background, I kind of skipped over that at the beginning. I have a PhD in public health and I also have a credential as a certified professional in healthcare quality, which is a quality improvement credential. So I look at hate music as a public health issue, as something that can be improved and comparing it to the field of music therapy. I could have picked any music profession and actually I could have picked any profession. I just picked music therapy because I it was most familiar with it and I thought it would be interesting to people. So given that, um, I do have a web page, a brand new web page is called tedfickenmusic.org, which you can visit. Um, it has some of those books um, on it as uh, suggested reads and also some groups to support. Um, and I'd love to hear from any of you. If you buy the book and read it, I'd love to hear what you think of it. It's kind of unique as a nonfiction book. Um, and with that, Paige, I think I'm gonna open it up for comments or questions. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Ted. That was wonderful. I, for one, bought your book. I'm actually getting ready to go on a trip on Wednesday, so it's going to be my airport book <laughs> about it. So um, I think it sounds great. I, there's a lot of information that I found really interesting and useful and a lot of things. I think I'm echoing a lot of what people said in the chat while you were presenting, um, but at least here on Zoom. I haven't been over on Facebook to see yet, but um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you said that I might have heard the name before, but I didn't know the full story. Um, I found it very interesting to listen to. So if, if anybody else here in Zoom has anything they want to throw in, uh, questions they want to ask, I would invite you to unmute yourselves and ask at this point. We have a few minutes. I'm going to check too on Facebook and see if anybody has said anything there as well. Let's see. Well, thank you for all the nice comments in the chat box, but I don't see any questions. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. Um, I don't see anything crazy on Facebook right now. Any questions or anything? I see uh, Deforia is uh, a part of the Zoom group and her story is in the book. Yes, yeah. Anyone want to type a question? No, I'll stay. Ted, I have a question. I feel that I'm pretty plugged into the culture. Heard a lot of rap music, and I'm a very accustomed to misogynistic music of that kind. But I never had heard this phrase before, hate music. And in spite of 65 years in vocal production and, you know, every kind of vocal music, I just wasn't familiar with it. Is, is it buried from the middle class and the upper middle class or how, how does it happen that in all these years I didn't hear about this kind of music? And Gail, who's a music therapist, hasn't had experience with a client who preferred this kind of music. I kind of switched to uh, special ed populations about 2000 and got away from the mental health um, psychiatric clients in about 2000. So it could have been something that's come around more strongly since then. But you found all that piano sheet music. I was floored when I saw that. We yeah, sang that's... sheet music all the time in my family of origin, and I don't remember anything like that. Yeah. 
there's that whole genre of the sea songs that actually started in the 1700s and got popular during the Civil War and, and in the early 20th century. Um, uh, someone loaned me a tape, well, actually a music therapist friend loaned me a tape called Bigot Songs and it had 75 songs on it, all of uh, very racist. Um, but in answer to your question, I was not aware of it either until I read this one article. But then when I started looking into it, um, Screwdriver, which is probably the most famous band, they have big, he died, uh, the lead singer, um, Ian Stewart Donaldson died in, in 86, I think. And still to this day, they're recording his songs, they're doing tributes to him, they celebrate his, his life every year worldwide. Um, and he was very racist, he was anti-immigrant, he was anti-Jews, he, um, he was anti-gays, um, just very... Um, well, I thank you for this information because I didn't know there was any significant subculture of which I was completely unaware. Yeah, you might, if you have you to look up Christian Picciolini, um, he has a, a bunch of tapes. Um, he has a TV show called Breaking Hate. And uh, he talks about it. Um, here I am in Virginia where Charlottesville happened. Right. There's one tape of him where he takes a recovering white supremacist to meet the mother of Heather Heyer, mm. who was killed in Charlottesville. And it's very interesting to see the former white supremacist um, hear the pain that the mother's going through and that she forgives him and, and they hug each other. Um, so forgiveness is possible and some of these people um, want help and are trying to change their ways. Ted, I, I am again amazed at the impression this gives uh, to my heart when I listen to you. This is the second time I've heard you present on this. And it's very, it's moving, it's convicting, it's inspiring, it's certainly educational, as the previous speaker said. I see it as extremely relevant, especially now, but it has been relevant for a long time. It's just that we are now seeing it face to face. We're up close and personal now because of all that's been happening. Um, I think I asked you this before, but I'd love to know the impact this has had on you emotionally. Um, certainly as an educator, I love the way you're, you're going about telling it. Um, and what is your next move? Wow. That's a lot of questions, Deforia. Thank you. Um, well, you can see from looking at me, I'm older, I'm white, I'm male, I'm a part of the privileged group of society that's been blind to the underprivileged and other groups. Um, so it's been humbling and it's been eye opening for me. And so I keep, what's next for me is I keep thinking about what action can I take? Um, and for now it's, it's using this book to try to speak out against hatred. Um, and since I'm from Oregon, we, the music therapists at Pacific University, we have a book reading club. In fact, I'm going to the book reading club right after this. <laughs> um, and so we're reading a series of books about um, social justice and discrimination and racism. And every book I read, I'm learning more. Um, so using hate music and music therapy as a medium, I'm um, trying to get the word out there and speak against hatred as much as I can. Um, I, I was a voice major in college. You know, I, I can play guitar, I can tinker on the keyboard, but, uh, I was a voice major, I'm still singing, um, but I got my start in a church boys choir um, that was all white. In fact, one of the other members of my choir was Lindsey Buckingham, who was the lead guitarist for Fleetwood Mac. Um, and 
So a part of a part of my book is dedicated to that choir director who showed he took us Christmas caroling at nursing homes. And that's where I first saw that music could help it, and to heal people and improve quality of life. So it's it's the ongoing path to for you. <laughs> You know, yes. <laughs> I keep learning. Right now, I'm trying to get that rock and roll museum in Cleveland to carry the book. Uh, since you uh, helped I'll them, start, <laughs> since you helped them start their toddler rock program. Yes. Uh, if you have any connections there, tell them to sell my book. <laughs> you got it. I sure will. I, I'm I'm amazed at how something so putrid and evil can create in you and those who are listening just the opposite the the need to go beyond it to to put it in its rightful place and um that that amazes me i i it shouldn't because i've, I've seen that in my own life but i i am very um again you've kind of triggered me to, okay, girl, come on now, get, get it going. <laughs> so uh, uh, thank well, you. Every that's why you guys, that's every why you guys are called therapists. Uh, say that again. <laughs> that's why you are called therapists. <laughs> every injustice that I see on the news makes me want to speak out more. Um, you know, after George Floyd, it was just, you know, I've seen those other incidents on the news and then I go on with my normal life and I need to be doing something else. I need to be taking action. Mm -hmm. So everybody remember to vote. <laughs> Already done. <laughs> do, do you, um, okay, ah, I'm getting to that age where if I don't say it right away, it's gone. <laughs> um, um, Okay, forget it. It'll come back. I don't know. Um, it's gone. I don't okay. know. Okay. <laughs> I think well, that we probably have other people who watch it back later as well, Ted. So what I'm going to just say is if you do think of questions later, I know that somebody had dropped in the chat that you're still kind of taking in everything that you're listening to and and we understand that's totally okay so if, if you think of questions later find the post in our music therapy leaders group as well if you're on our facebook group um we it was streamed there as well if you're not in the zoom channel uh, and you can drop comments and questions there you can email us at info at musictherapyed.com and we'll be happy to relay those questions to ted as well um, or connect you with him in some way, whatever's appropriate. Um, we're always here to support those questions and, and that desire to grow. So um, anytime that you think of a question later, please feel free to, to reach out to us somehow and we will figure out how to answer that for you. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you have any wrap up thoughts, Ted. We, we have about four minutes until four oh. and a couple minutes left if anybody else thinks of anything or if you have any final thoughts you wanna share. Well, thank you, Paige, for moderating and yeah, helping. Um, and I want to thank everyone who tuned in um, and let me talk about this book and, and about these issues. I think they're very important. Um, it's, I, I'm feeling at a loss because we're not having an AMTA in-person conference this year because I like seeing everybody and talking to everyone. Um, and Laleen is receiving an award. So I wanted to be there for that. Um, anyway, I thank, thank you all for you. coming. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dr. Ted Fick and friend life that I'm getting that award. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd love to hear from all of you. If you get the book, let me know what you think of it. Um, I'll keep learning. And, you know, people, people write to teach, but people also write to learn and I am learning. So keep your comments coming. Um, I have a website, Ted Ficken at tedfickenmusic.org. Awesome. And I'll say with um, Ted's little 
talk there about AMTA as well and, and how things are looking with COVID this year. Uh, I don't know if you guys have all seen, but keep an eye out for our resilient practice conference too, because we're going to try and build in some of those features of being able to converse with others and share ideas as well uh, to our virtual conferences here on Music Therapy Ed as well, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, so I hope that a lot of people can join us for that as well. Um, yeah, I, th I think that Ted, if you don't, if that's, if you're good, I think we're good. And okay. Else has Thank any final again, questions? Everyone. Yeah. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, and I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. And we look forward to hearing any questions you have in the future. Thank you so much, Ted. Bye.